All right. I love to teach on eschatology. It's one of my favorite topics. Every year at our seminary, I give an entire course on ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, and eschatology. And in the eschatology part of that course, it may surprise you that I never even touch the book of Revelation until the very last class meeting. I spend 60 to 70 percent of my time on the topic of eschatology in the Old Testament because the foundation of eschatology comes from the Old Testament, not from the book of Revelation. And if you want to be confused about God's plan for the end times, read the book of Revelation before you read any of the rest of the Bible. I guarantee you, you will be confused. That's exactly the wrong way to do it. So today we're going to talk about how sound interpretation leads to the premillennial and dispensational understanding of God's plan for the end times. Now, you remember in the first talk last night, we talked about the axes of theology. And we saw that we've got dispensationalism on one side and covenant theology on the other side. I want to go back to those for a moment. Covenant theology is a method of interpretation that's based on theological presuppositions, whereas dispensational theology is a system of theology that's based on interpretive presuppositions. In other words, covenant theologians start with certain ideas that they believe have to be true, and they, and they interpret the Bible to support those beliefs, whereas dispensational theology simply starts with the belief that when God gave us his word, he meant it to be understandable. It's internally consistent, it's logical, and it all holds together. Now, covenant the theology is guilty of circular reasoning, reasoning that imposes ideas on the biblical text, whereas dispensational theology works by linear reasoning that allows God's word to say what it means. And I believe that is why in the areas where covenant theologians and dispensational theologians disagree, we should stick with dispensational theology. Covenant theology applies a literal or allegorical interpretive method selectively leading to these conclusions, that Israel is either the church or the replacement for the church, that the proper understanding of the end times is amil or post-mill eschatology. I will explain those two words to you in a little while, and that there's no future for the nation of Israel. Dispensational theology applies literal interpretation consistently to the entire Bible, and it leads to conclusions that are somewhat different. Israel and the church are not the same group. The proper understanding of the end times is premillennialism, and there is going to be a future messianic kingdom in which the nation of Israel will occupy a very important role. Now, again, covenant theology is based on theological covenants that are not found in Scripture. I want to look at the basis of dispensational theology in covenants that are found in Scripture. You know, it's sad. Dispensational theology should be called covenant theology because it's based on covenants that are found in the Bible, but we couldn't use that name because somebody already had it. We're going to be looking at four biblical covenants that God made with the nation of Israel or its representatives. And these are the Abrahamic covenant, the land or the Mosaic or the Palestinian covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. I want to introduce you to these four covenants, and uh, then we'll see how they help us to see why God's end time plan must be a premillennial plan. The first covenant that we're going to be looking at is the Abrahamic covenant. Now, in Genesis chapter 12, God first spoke the promises of the Abrahamic covenant to the man we call Abraham. He was called Abram at the time. Abram was in the land of Ur, and God spoke to him and said, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, Get out of your country and away from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now God is going to repeat the promises of this covenant during the life of Abraham. He will formally establish this covenant by a cutting procedure involving the use of sacrificial animals in chapter 15. I'm going to summarize the things that he promises to Abraham in this covenant because of time. The first thing that he promises is that Abraham will become a great nation. Now, when God spoke the promises to Abram or Abraham, he was already an old man. His wife was an extraordinarily beautiful woman, but she was past the age of childbearing. And the idea that they were ever going to have children was impossible, humanly speaking. But God said, I will make you into a great nation. And that meant that he would give Abraham many descendants. God also promised to Abraham a certain piece of land, the land that we call the promised land. And in the course of giving the covenant to Abraham, God made it clear that the covenant promises would be passed on to Isaac, not Ishmael, and to Jacob, not Esau, and then to the 12 patriarchs. Now that small piece of land that the modern state of Israel occupies in the Middle East today is a tiny fraction of the large piece of land that God promised the nation of Israel as an eternal possession. God also said that all nations will be blessed through Israel. And certainly the greatest blessing that has come to the world through Israel is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, A number of years later, after the Israelites had gone into the promised land and then God brought them, I'm sorry, after the Israelites had gone to Egypt and God brought them out of Egypt through the ministry of Moses and brought them to the promised land, God gave them the land or the Mosaic or the Palestinian covenant. Now, God first spoke this covenant when Israel had just come out of Israel. Uh, I keep on... Let me me reset my brain. When Israel had just come out of Egypt and they were camped at the base of Mount Sinai. You can read that first giving of the covenant in Leviticus 26. And because our time is short, I won't do that. Now, almost 40 years later, after the Israelites had wandered through the desert because they had rebelled at Kadesh Barnea, they had come up on the east side of the Jordan River and they were just getting ready to cross over the river. God had told Moses that he would not be permitted to cross the river and go into that part of the promised land. So Moses gave a series of three messages to Israel and we call them the book of Deuteronomy. In chapters 28, 29, and 30 of Deuteronomy, God again repeats the Mosaic or land or Palestinian covenant and It has three main components. First of all, God said that he would train the nation of Israel. He would discipline them. You know, isn't it interesting? When we hear the word discipline, we think of punishment. But when we hear the word disciple, we think of training. But discipline and discipling are the same thing. The purpose of discipling is to train people not to do the wrong thing and to train them to do the right thing. And so when God said to the nation of Israel, I will discipline you by blessing you for obedience and by cursing you for disobedience, he was saying, I'm going to train you to walk with me faithfully. Now, if you were to read Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 and 29, you would see, as I've said before, that the blessings of this covenant are material blessings the rain coming at the right time, the crops growing, the flocks growing, the families growing, security, political strength, no fear of the other nations around you. And the curses would be the removal of those blessings and then bringing things like drought, famine, attacks by locusts, raiding parties from neighboring nations, and God said that if the nation continued to be disobedient to them, to him, he would have to impose the worst of all the covenant penalties, and that would be invasion by a foreign people who would conquer the Israelites and exile them to another place. 
Now, interestingly, in Deuteronomy 28, God goes further. He goes beyond, if you obey me, I'll bless you. If you disobey me, I'll curse you, to a prediction. And the prediction is that the day will come when he will have to impose the judgment of exile. It's not just a possibility, it's a certainty. And the only question from that point forward is when will it happen? Now lastly, in Deuteronomy 30, God said, a day will come in the future after the time when I have to kick you out of the land, when I will bring you back, but that return to the land will take place when the nation of Israel as a whole has turned back to me in saving faith. Well, the next covenant that God gave was like the Abrahamic covenant in that it was given to an individual serving as the representative of the nation of Israel. It was King David. It took King David about seven years to consolidate the nation of Israel under his reign. And when he had done that, one night he was thinking, and he said, you know, it's not right that I have a palace and yet the Ark of the Covenant is still housed in that temporary movable tabernacle that was made hundreds of years ago. And so David calls in a prophet and he says, I'm going to build a house for God, meaning a temple for God. And the prophet says, great idea. Well, a little bit later that night, the prophet gets a call on his cell phone. No, it's not a cell phone. But he gets a message from God, and God basically says, you shouldn't have told David that was a good idea. Here is what you should tell King David. He says, David, you are a man with blood on your hands. You are a warrior. I don't want you to build the temple for me. I will have your son build the temple. Now, I've put on the screen here that Solomon will build the temple, but when God spoke this promise, Solomon wasn't born yet, and he didn't name Solomon. It turned out to be Solomon. God also said that if that son of yours is faithful to me, I will bless him. And if he's unfaithful to me, I will discipline him. But God said, if he's unfaithful to me, the discipline that I place on him will not be like the discipline that I placed on King Saul. Because when King Saul was unfaithful to God, God not only removed him as king, but he ended Saul's dynasty. What God was saying was that even if David and his descendants were unfaithful to God, David's dynasty would be the only dynasty that would continue. The third thing that God said was that one day, a day would come when a descendant of King David would begin to reign over the people of Israel in the land of Israel. And from that moment forward, the reign of the line of David would never end. Now, the thing that's very interesting about this covenant is that God did not say to David, this is going to happen with an unbroken succession of kings who will follow you. In fact, God left open the possibility that the nation of Israel would cease to be a kingdom and that there would be a long period of time when there was no descendant of David reigning on the throne. But the promise guaranteed that a day would come when the kingdom would be reestablished under the reign of a descendant of David. And from that point forward, there would always be a descendant of David reigning. The other thing that's interesting about it is that God didn't make it clear whether it would be one person who would reign forever over the throne or whether it would be a string of descendants of David who would reign once the kingdom was established permanently. Now, we know, with the best benefit of New Testament revelation, that the way that covenant is going to be fulfilled is that one person will be the eternal king over the reestablished kingdom of Israel, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. But that wasn't clear to David at the time. The fourth covenant that God gave to the nation of Israel, he gave at a very black time in their history. He revealed it first through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31. And when God revealed this covenant, the nation of Israel had already split. In the year 931 after Solomon died, the kingdom split into the northern kingdom, which is typically called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which is called Judah. 
Judah was reigned over in an unbroken succession of kings in the line of David. Israel was reigned over by illegitimate kings who weren't from the line of David. In 722 BC, the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom and exiled its people into their territory. In 586 BC, the Babylonians finally conquered Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, and they exiled the people of Judah. Now just before the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem, Jeremiah gave this covenant. And this covenant is very interesting. I, <clears throat> I want to read it directly to you to make sure that we get it straight. It's in Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 31. God says, Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Now when he says they broke my covenant, he's referring to the sin of the golden calf. Verse 33, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their sin and I will and forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now I want you to notice something about how this covenant starts. God says, behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. People often miss this. God makes it very clear that at this point in history, when the nation of Israel is split, that this covenant is made only with the covenant people, the descendants of the 12 patriarchs. Many Christians try to claim the new covenant and say that it is ours, but the Bible says that it is Israel's. And how the new covenant that we read about here is related to the phrase new covenant in the New Testament is one of the most challenging issues in theology. And I won't have time to talk about that today. Let me simply say this. We have blessings that are similar to what is spoken of here. But what is spoken of here is uniquely for Israel. Now let me summarize what I see in the New Covenant. First of all, God predicted that at some time in the future there would be a generation of Israelites on planet Earth, mortal living Israelites, all of whom are believers. Now that's never happened in human history. It hasn't happened yet. It will happen, and I'll tell you when a little bit later. Secondly, this predicts a day is coming when the Israelites will be returned to their land and they will dwell there securely and they will never be kicked out again. Now this is made more clear in some of the other passages that I haven't read. And lastly, we have a repetition of an earlier promise, a promise that a descendant of King David will reign forever over the nation of Israel. Well, these are the four biblical covenants, the Abrahamic the land covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. And the question is, how do these contribute to our understanding of God's plan for the end times? Well, I believe they give us a window into his plan. And let me explain to you the argumentation here. And I believe that this is very logical argumentation. First of all, God is faithful. God is faithful. What does it mean to say that a person is faithful? It means that whatever that person promises he will do. God is faithful. And in the biblical covenants, God made a number of promises to the people of Israel as a diachronic body. You see that word diachronic? It literally means through time. The Israelites are a diachronic body, meaning that they have an identity that continues from generation to generation to generation. Now, isn't it strange that the Israelites were out of their land for almost 2,000 years, and yet they didn't lose their identity? You know, if you go to America today, you'll see a lot of bananas. You know what bananas are? 
ABCs, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. Chinese who grew up in America and they're just as American as I am, perhaps even more American. Why is it then when people emigrate to other countries, within a few generations they tend to lose the identity of where they came from, but the Jews never did? It's one of the most amazing things of history. They have maintained their identity. And so Israel still exists as a diachronic body and therefore God is obligated to fulfill the promises that he made to them. Now, since God is faithful, every promise that he has made to the nation of Israel either has been fulfilled in the past or will be fulfilled in the future. So we can examine the past and see God's faithfulness to his past promises of it, to Israel, both to bless and to judge. And then, by examining which promises he made that are still unfulfilled, we can gain insight into what must occur in the future. It's a really very simple argument. What God promises, he must do. What has he already done? What remains undone? Whatever remains undone must be part of his plan for the future. Now, let's look at the promises of the covenant and ask ourselves, the covenants, and ask ourselves which of them remain unfulfilled and which have been fulfilled. Has Abraham become a great nation? Absolutely. There are millions of Jews in the world today. Is Israel possessing their land in a way that I would call an eternal possession? Let me put it another way. Is the nation of Israel in a secure position? No way. The nation of Israel is surrounded by enemies. And they would love to do nothing more than to push every living Jew into the Mediterranean Sea and let them drown. Israel is not in a position where it has confidence that it's going to be in the land forever. And I would say that this promise has not been fulfilled. Now, have all nations been blessed through Israel? Well, in some ways, through the people of Israel, the scriptures came to us. Through the people of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ came through to us. But there are more promises spoken of in the Old Testament, blessings that are going to come to the world through the nation of Israel that haven't been fulfilled yet. So if I were going to be technical, I'd probably put a checkbox and an X next to that one. Now moving on to the land or mosaic or Palestinian, Palestinian covenant. Has Israel been disciplined by blessing and cursing? Yes, it has. In fact, if you want to understand the history of Old Testament Israel, study the land covenant and then track through the history of Old Testament Israel and you will see again and again cycles where the people are walking faithfully and they're blessed by God. Then they drift from God and God sends judgment. You, then they repent and God restores them to blessing. Now the first place you see this is in the, in the book of Judges. There are seven of these cycles where they sin, they suffer, there's supplication, God sends a deliverer, and then they're restored to blessing. But they just keep on going and they don't learn the lesson. They think that their problem is that they don't have a king like the other nations, so they ask God for a king of the type that they want and who does God give them? He gives them Arnold Schwarzenegger. He gives them King Saul. He's tall, he's muscular, he's brave. But he's not a king after God's own heart. And if you were to continue through the history of Old Testament Israel, you would see that each time the nation falls into idolatry or trusting in other nations, each time they drift from faithfulness to God, God will impose covenant curses, and when they repent, he will restore them to blessing. The other thing you will see if you go through the history of Old Testament Israel is that God becomes more and more patient with their sin. Now, please don't assume that it's good that he becomes patient because early on, when he reacts quickly, the people get the message quickly. But later on, when he reacts more and more slowly, the people begin to think that God really doesn't care. Or even more, they begin to think 
Yahweh isn't the God we need to please. We need to please the other gods like Baal and Ashtoreth. Now, God will send the prophets to warn them over and over again, and the message of the prophets is usually the same thing. Why are you suffering? It's because you're unfaithful to me. Return to me and I will bless you. There are also predictions of coming judgment and predictions of future restoration, and most of those predictions of future restoration look forward to the kingdom of Messiah that has not yet been established. Back to the covenant promises. Did God judge the nation of Israel by exile as he predicted? Yes, he did. Now, what about the third one? Has there been a final return of the Israelites to the land after the exile in a context where they all go back and they're all believers? The answer is no. Now, it was only a few years ago that the number of Jews in the nation of Israel exceeded the number of Jews in the United States. See, when I grew up, I grew up on the east coast of the U.S. That's where most of the Jews were. There were far more Jews in the area of New York City, probably than all the rest of the world combined, and certainly more than there were in the the land of Israel. But the fact that there are still Jews spread all, all over the world, and the vast majority of Jews are unbelievers, shows us that this promise has not been fulfilled. On to the Davidic covenant. Did Solomon build the temple? Yes, he did. Was Solomon disciplined by God? Yes, he was. Is there a descendant of King David reigning over the people of Israel in the land of Israel in an earthly kingdom? Is that happening? Has that ever happened? Never. What about the new covenant? Has there ever been an entire generation when all Israelites are born again believers in God? No. By the way, Don't be confused by what I just said. Old Testament saints were born again just like we are. They didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit, but they were born again just like we are, are, believing Old Testament Israelites. You know that from Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. He says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus asks the question, and Jesus says, don't you know the Old Testament scriptures? Old Testament Israelites who were believers were born again just just like we are. But there has never been a generation where all living Israelites are believers. Is Israel dwelling securely in her land in a forever way? No. Is a descendant of King David reigning over the kingdom of Israel in a forever way? No. So all of these things that have red X's are unfulfilled. Now here's the key idea. The promises of God that remain unfulfilled must be fulfilled in the future. Looking at those red X's will help us to understand God's end time plan. So how will God's promises be fulfilled? Well, if we take God's promises to Israel at face value according to a literal interpretation, which is a dispensational approach to Scripture, we see that there are at least four promises that remain unfulfilled that he must fulfill to the nation of Israel as a diachronic body in the future. What are they? There must be a return of a repentant generation of Israelites to their land. Secondly, Israel must possess their land securely in such a way that they will never be expelled again. Thirdly, there has to be the salvation of an entire generation of living Israelites. And fourthly, there must be an unending reign of an heir of King David over the nation of Israel. And of course, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ is in heaven now, isn't he? He's not functioning as a king. He's functioning as the head of the church. He's our cornerstone. He is the bridegroom and we are the bride. He is our high priest. But he is not the king of the church and the church is not the nation of Israel. Now here's where we come to the disagreement between dispensational theologians and covenant theologians regarding God's promises to that nation and how he will fulfill them. Covenant theologians believe that because the Jews rejected Jesus at his first coming, God's promises to Israel have either been canceled or transferred figuratively to the church. So covenant theologians believe that promise number four is being fulfilled now 
as Christ reigns as king over the church. Dispensational theologians say something different. We believe that God will fulfill all four promises literally in the future when Jesus returns to begin his reign over the nation of Israel and over all the earth. Now to settle this question of which one of these views is correct, aside from the fact that the covenant promises make it clear that the dispensational understanding is correct, we need to discover when according to scripture, when, when according to God's plan, the reign of Jesus is going to begin. But before we look at the biblical evidence for that, I want to familiarize you with the three main views of the end times. Okay? Now, everybody who is trying to understand the end times looks at the pieces of the puzzle. Remember last night we talked about pieces of the puzzle and trying to assemble them using the analogy of scripture that all the pieces of scripture will fit together, in particular the pieces of prophecy, if we take time to figure out how they go together. So here's a list of major end time events in scripture. Everybody who takes the Bible seriously recognizes these events as part of God's eternal plan, although there is some disagreement about the nature and their place in time. Now the first coming and the cross are past, but we're going to use that sort of as an anchoring point. The Bible says that there's going to be something called the rapture. The Bible predicts a period of time commonly known as the tribulation. If you want to get more technical, it's the 70th 7 of Daniel. The Bible talks about the reign of the Antichrist. It talks about Christ coming back to earth. It talks about the millennial kingdom of Christ. It talks about the great white throne judgment. And it speaks of the creation of the new heavens and new earth. Now, we all agree that all believers will live in the new heavens and new earth. We're all going to get there. The question we're really dealing with now is what's going to happen between where we are now and when we get to the new heavens and new earth. Now centuries of study of these events have led to just three ways to organize these events according to the evidence of scripture in a timeline. And, and as Dr. Valdez has been telling us, contradictory things cannot both be true. We're going to see that all three of these are contradictory, each one is contradictory to the other two, so at the very best, only one can be true. It's also possible that all three are false, but I don't think that's the case. They're called the amillennial, postmillennial, and premillennial viewpoints. Now let me just put them up on the screen, and then I'll explain them to you. On the top, we have the amillennial view. I'll explain the titles to you in a few minutes. The amillennial view says that we are living in the church age, and during the church age, the world is going downhill spiritually. Ungodliness is on the in increase, and Christ is in heaven ruling over the church only in the sense that he rules in the hearts of believers. Now, people who hold to the amill view believe that there is a single great event coming in which there will be a rapture, Christ will arrive on the earth, he will perform the judgment known as the great white throne judgment, which is described in Revelation chapter 20, and immediately after that judgment, when he has taken all of the unsaved people of all time and cast them into the lake of fire, then all saved people of all time will move on into the new heavens and new earth, and there we will enjoy eternity with each other and with God. Now the post-millennial view is exactly the same as the amillennial view in terms of the sequence of events. The difference is that post-millennialists believe that Christ is in heaven ruling over the earth through the church. Now if you stop and think about it, the idea that Christ is ruling over the earth through the church would imply that the church is ruling the world. And I hope you recognize that the idea that the Christian church is ruling the world is a pretty crazy idea. Hardly anybody believes that now. But a couple of hundred years ago, 
when the British Empire was expanding and America was beginning to send out missionaries and science and technology were mushrooming and we were in the middle of the industrial age and there seemed to be unlimited progress coming. People believed that the Christian church was going to bring the reign of Christ to the whole world. There are actually hymns in our hymn books that have that kind of an idea. It's the idea that the church is going to Christianize the planet. And it doesn't mean that everybody will be saved. But it does mean that Christian morality, Christian ethics, Christian ways of doing things will dominate the world. And when Christians have fixed the world, then Jesus will come back and he will take the reins and he will rule. That idea pretty much died with World War I when it became obvious that the direction of humanity was not up spiritually, it was down. Now the third view is the premillennial view. This is the view that all dispensationalists hold to. You notice that it's much more complicated. The three events that are joined together in one event in amillennialism and postmillennialism are split apart into three events. First, we've got the rapture, followed by the seven-year tribulation. The tribulation ends when Christ returns to the earth. That is followed by the millennial kingdom, which is the reign of Christ on this earth, not the new earth in the new heavens and earth. That's followed by the great white throne judgment. And then we move into the time of the new heavens and new earth. Now, if you look at the amillennial view, their view is that Christ is in heaven ruling over the church. The post-millennial view is that right now Christ is in heaven ruling through the church. And the pre-millennial view is that Christ is now in heaven waiting to rule. Now, if you take the time to study the next period of time, the time of the tribulation, you will see that both Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation predict that during that seven-year period of time, Christ in heaven is going to be pouring out a series of judgments on the earth. They're called the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments. And I think the best way to view them is that they're like an artillery barrage from heaven preparing for the invasion of Jesus Christ that will take place at the second coming. So during the tribulation, Christ is going to be preparing for his rule. He's going to be preparing to invade planet Earth and take the rule of planet Earth away from Satan and place it in his own hands, which is where it belongs. At the second coming, he will return to Earth. He will begin reigning on Earth. He will reign on Earth all through the millennium. Revelation 20 predicts a brief rebellion at the end of that period of time that will be unsuccessful the great white throne judgment will take place and then we will move into the eternal state. So you can see that premillennialism is much more complicated, but please notice something. Premillennialism has a time when God will fulfill the promises that he made to the nation of Israel. That period of time is the time that we call the millennium. All right? Now, where do the names come from? They come from the relationship between the second coming of Christ, his arrival on earth, and the millennium. Premillennialists believe that Christ comes back before the millennium. The second coming is before the millennium. Now, postmillennialists, postmillennial means that Christ comes back after the millennium. Now, where do they get that idea? They get that idea because they say that the church age is a non-literal millennium. It is the reign of Christ over the earth through the church. So he's reigning now and he'll come back at the end of it just before the new heavens and the new earth. Now, the amillennialists don't follow the rule. Amillennialists say, no, we're not premillennial and we're not postmillennial. Amillennial literally means not millennial. Amillennialists hold to the same sequence of events, but they deny that Christ is ruling over the world through the church. They would just say that Christ is ruling in the hearts of believers. They would still call that sort of a spiritual millennium, but not in the way that premillennialists do, 
and not in the way that post-millennialists do. Obviously, these three views do not all use the term millennium in the same way. Now again, the pre-mill view says that the millennium is Christ's future reign over the present earth that will last a literal 1,000 years and continue into eternity. The post-mill view says that the millennium is Christ's present rule over the earth through the church and the figure 1,000 which comes from Revelation chapter 20 just means a long time. Now that's a little problematical because Christ has been in heaven almost 2,000 years and 2,000 years is a lot more, a lot more than 1,000 years, but that's their view. The Amil view says that the millennium is Christ's present rule in the hearts of believers in the church, and again, 1,000 years means a long time. Now please notice the similarities and the differences. The pre mill view sees Christ returning to establish a literal earthly millennial kingdom after the church age and before the replacement of this universe with the new heavens and new earth. And it separates the rapture, the second coming, and the great white throne. Okay, the amill and post-mill views understand the church age as some kind of non-literal millennium and they see the rapture, the second coming, and the great white throne as a single event. Now I'm not going to say much about the rapture today except that you should notice that in the pre-mill view, most premillennialists believe that the rapture takes place before the tribulation. Christ will come down and he will get living believers and take them up to heaven and dead believers will also be resurrected and they will go up to heaven with him. The rapture is a rescue. He comes to rescue that last generation of Christians so that they don't have to experience the judgments of the tribulation. In the post-mill and ah-mill view, the rapture is something different. Christ comes down, we go up to meet him, and then we return to the earth. There's no time spent in heaven for resurrected saints in the ah-mill or post-mill view. Now here's the big question. Which one of these views of the end times is right? Well, I see two reasons why the pre-mill view must be the correct view. First of all, only the pre-mill view has a time during which God can fulfill his unfulfilled promises to the nation of Israel. And secondly, the Bible indicates that Messiah's kingdom starts at the second coming. Now I want to examine these reasons and then consider the significance of God's dispensational plan. First of all, only the pre-mill view has a future time period in which God's still unfulfilled covenant and earthly promises to Israel can be fulfilled. Now it's called a number of things in scripture. It's called the reign of the branch of David in the book of Jeremiah. It's called the kingdom of the God of heaven in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. It's called the kingdom of the son of man in Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 to 14. It's called the kingdom of heaven in Matthew's Gospel. It's called the restored kingdom of Israel in Acts chapter 1. Let's turn there. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 1. When we come to Acts chapter 1, Jesus has risen from the dead. He's spent 40 days with the apostles teaching them. And in verse 4 we read this, and being assembled together with them, he, con he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus' answer was, you boneheads, don't you understand that because your nation rejected me, there will be no kingdom? Is that what it says? It's not what it says. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. He doesn't attack the question. In fact, his response confirms the accuracy of their assumption that he will return to restore the kingdom. Notice what he, what he, how he continues. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Judea and in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria 
and to the ends of the earth. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, between now and the time when I come back to establish the kingdom of Israel according to the Old Testament promises, I have a job for you. That job is the Great Commission. And when they died, they passed that job on to us. Revelation 20 calls that future time the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ. Now, I won't go through these passages with you, but you can check them later. Isaiah chapter 19, Isaiah 65, Psalm 2, Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10, and many other Old Testament passages predict that Messiah's kingdom, when it comes into existence, must be, it must commence before eternity because it's going to have subjects that will include sinful mortals who reproduce, who grow old, and who die. And there won't be any such people in the eternal state. It must be before the eternal state. So if it's before the eternal state and it's after the second coming, when is it? It's still in the future. All right? So back to the question, which view of the end times is right? Well, the Bible indicates that Messiah's kingdom will begin at the second coming and it still is future. How do you know that? Let's turn to Daniel chapter 7 and look at verse 13. <clears throat> Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Now what are we seeing here? We're seeing the Messiah standing before God the Father. Then to him was given dominion and glory in a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. You see how that's a reference to the Davidic kingdom that was predicted in the Old Testament covenants? Notice that this prediction will be fulfilled when Jesus returns to the earth with the clouds of heaven. That phrase, the clouds of heaven, appears again and again in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 24, let's take a quick look at that. Matthew 24. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's the second coming. Now let's go back to Acts chapter 1 and finish the story that we began to read a few minutes ago. Right after the disciples asked Jesus when he will restore the kingdom, and he tells them, I've got a job for you to do until I come back, this is what we read, verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. How did he go up? With the clouds. How is he going to come back? With the clouds. And the book of Daniel says that when he returns with the clouds, that's when he is going to establish the future kingdom of Israel. That's when he's going to fulfill the promises made to the nation of Israel that haven't been fulfilled yet. Messiah's kingdom doesn't exist yet. The church is not his kingdom. Now, 2 Peter chapter 1. This is a really interesting one. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. It's one of the greatest motivations to godly living. If we had time, I'd start in verse 5, but we don't have time. That's where Peter calls us to build what I call the tower of Christian virtues. He says, 
add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. He's calling us to cooperate with our Father and with the indwelling Holy Spirit in the process of sanctification, in growing to be more like Jesus. And he says, verse 8, if these things are yours and they abound, you will be neither fruitful nor barren in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, do you see the implication there? It's possible for a Christian to be unfruitful and barren. It's not good, but it's possible. If we're going to be fruitful, we need to make an effort. Now, verse 9, he says, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. A Christian who doesn't pursue sanctification is almost like someone who has forgotten that God has saved him. Then he says in verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. Now, he's not saying work for your salvation. He's saying act in such a way that it will be evident to the people around you that God has saved you, that he has changed you. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Now listen to the next statement. For in such a way, an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you notice what Peter just said? He said, you haven't entered the kingdom yet. And you know what else he's saying? He's saying, when you go into the kingdom, you can either have an abundant entrance, meaning you've got a big reward, or you can have a meager entrance. Now, if I live a lazy Christian life, when I stand before Christ at the Bema Seat Judgment, he will evaluate my works, and he will hand me my reward and if I live a lazy Christian life, he might give me my reward in a teaspoon. But if I have lived a fruitful life by the power of the Holy Spirit, cooperating with him, he might need a tractor trailer to give me my reward. And when I go into the kingdom, it will be an abundant entrance. That's what we should all be looking for. But none of us have entered the kingdom yet. You can't enter the kingdom because it doesn't exist yet. But there's more to the story. So, summer, summary of reasons for the pre mill view. The pre mill view takes God's promises seriously and upholds his faithfulness. Secondly, it fits consistent literal interpretation of Scripture, including prophecy. Thirdly, the New Testament never calls Jesus the king of the church. Fourthly, the Jews and the early church all believed in the pre mill return of Christ. Amillennialism and postmillennialism were invented hundreds of years later. And I've said this before if we abandon literal interpretation of prophecy, why not abandon literal interpretation of other parts of Scripture? And lastly, if God isn't faithful to his promises to Israel, why should we believe that he'll be faithful to his promises to us? How many of you have died? We're all still alive, haven't we? But what has God promised us? He has promised us because we have trusted in the gospel that when we die... He will willingly accept us into his presence and not send us to the place where those who haven't received his forgiveness go. And that is hell. If God is unfaithful to Israel, we have no reason to believe that he's going to be faithful to us. Now I have two more slides that I want to show you. Why do we call it dispensational theology? Well, the word dispensation is a New Testament word it's the Greek word oikonomia. It literally means the law of the house. And you might be able to tell it's the word from which we get the modern term economy. A dispensation is a way of doing things. Now Paul calls the church age the dispensation of the grace of God in Ephesians chapter 3. And he calls the eternal state the dispensation of the fullness of time in Ephesians 1.10. 
Dispensationalists are called dispensationalists because they see God working in different ways with different groups of people at different times. But the dispensations are really a result of the dispensational approach to scripture. The heart of dispensationalism, as I shared with you last night, is consistent literal interpretation. Now here's a list of the seven dispensations in the Bible. There's the dispensation of innocence, which ran from creation to the fall, the dispensation of conscience, that ran from the fall to the flood, the dispensation of human government, which ran from the flood to Abram, the dispensation of promise, that runs from Abraham to Moses, the dispensation of law that runs from Moses to the cross with one small exception that I'll explain in a little bit. There's the dispensation of grace that runs from the cross to the second coming, that's where we live, and the dispensation of the kingdom that will run from the second coming through the millennium and continue on into eternity. Now, dispensationalists believe that salvation has always been by grace through faith apart from works. Salvation is always through Christ. Everyone who has ever been saved before the cross and since the cross is saved because of Christ's atoning work. But the object of faith has not always been Christ. Now how do we know this? Because we know that Abraham was saved by believing God's promise that he would give him a son. We are saved by believing God's promise that when Christ died on the cross, it was to pay for our sins and that he rose from the dead to prove that the payment had been accepted. Now, many dispensationalists would argue that each dispensation includes suitable revelation for the dispensation, human responsibility to obey that revelation, a testing of man according to the revelation, a failure of man in the test, a divine judgment for that failure, and a transition to the next dispensation. But this is not the heart of dispensationalism. The heart of dispensationalism is literal interpretation of scripture. Now here's my last slide, and I realize it's gonna be hard for you to see the details of this slide. But on this slide, I've shown you a timeline that takes us from creation all the way into eternity. And I've labeled the different dispensations on the slide. Now, the dispensations that are most important for us are the dispensation of grace in which we live and the coming dispensation of the kingdom. Now, you can see the cross on the timeline. None of this is to scale. Please understand that I've spread some things out and compressed others so that you can see it all. Now, we call this premillennialism because Christ will return to the earth before he establishes his earthly messianic kingdom in the millennium. We call it dispensational because the focus of God's work has varied through time. Now, some of you are familiar with Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 has the great prophecy of the 77s. And in that chapter, God says that 77s are appointed for the nation of Israel to take it from a certain point in time to the point when Messiah comes to establish his kingdom. Each one of those sevens is apparently a period of seven years where each year consists of 360 days. The first 69 of those sevens were fulfilled between the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem in March 5th, 444 BC and the triumphal entry. Now let me just read to you a little bit from Daniel chapter 9 to orient you to what he's saying. Daniel chapter 9, starting with verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that's March 5th, 444 BC, until Messiah the Prince. Now it's interesting, Messiah the Prince is a person, not an event. So we have to figure out what that event is, but it turns out that that event is the triumphal entry. Why is it the triumphal entry? Well, first, because the mathematics works out, but secondly, because the triumphal entry was the only day in the ministry of Jesus Christ on earth during his first coming 
when he allowed people to declare that he was the Messiah and didn't tell them to be quiet. That was the day when he offered himself to the nation of Israel as their king, and he did it by doing what kings in the ancient Near East would do when they were preparing to be crowned. He rode on a donkey toward the temple. And some of the Israelites said, praise God, this is the coming kingdom of our father David. This was what was predicted in the Old Testament. And others said, who is this nut? And of course, the triumphal entry was not a triumph. It was a tragedy. The nation of Israel rejected Christ, and a few days later, they killed him. So going forward, verse 26, and after the 62 weeks. Now, the first 69 are broken down into a period of 7 and 62. 7 plus 62 adds up to 69. So after the 62 weeks means at the end of this 69-week period, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. That's the cross. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. That latter part is a prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Now, when the first 69 sevens were completed, it was like God took his stopwatch. He's got a stopwatch that will make one complete revelation in 490 years of 360 days apiece. That's 70 times 7. He stopped the stopwatch when it reached 69 years. And where do we live? Well, it turns out that we live in a little gap. Now, I'm going to get to that gap in a moment. God will resume the clicking down, the countdown of that stopwatch at the tribulation, when the tribulation begins and the rapture takes place. The 70th seven will pass and Jesus will come back. Now, what's in the middle? The middle is where we live. Romans chapter 11 says that hardening in part has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Why are all you Gentiles in the body of Christ? Because God very graciously stopped his stopwatch for Israel and said, I'm going to allow the apostles and those who follow them to go out and proclaim the gospel to all the world. That's how we all got saved. But the day will come when God is going to remove the church from the earth and then he will go click again with his stopwatch and the 70th seven will count down and when that time has run out, Christ will return. Now the New Testament says that the church age is a mystery. A mystery is something that was always part of God's plan but was kept secret until a certain time. We are living in that mystery period. Interestingly, the dispensation of law actually runs all the way from the time of the Exodus to the second coming of Christ, but we live in a dispensation that's been stuck in the middle of it while God has suspended the focus of his work on Israel. So the focus of his work with Israel halted at the triumphal entry when they rejected Christ, it will resume again at the time of the rapture when the 70th seven begins to count down. And during those seven years, God will be working to bring the people of Israel to the repentance that's predicted in the covenants. And when they are ready to receive him as Messiah, he will return and set up his earthly kingdom. So why is covenant theology sometimes misleading? Well, remember, covenant theologians and dispensational theologians agree on the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. Born-again Christians who hold to either of these theologies can work together to proclaim the gospel and fulfill the Great Commission. Where we disagree is primarily on whether or not Israel and the church have distinct identities and roles in God's plan. This is not a fundamental issue of orthodoxy, but it does have significant implications in a number of areas. Baptism and its significance, salvation before and after the cross, the meaning of entering the kingdom in the Gospels, 
the nature of priesthood in the body of Christ and the place of the law in the, bo- in the life of the believer. We will touch on some of these issues in my last message. Now, the last thing I'm going to say before we have our break is this. Most of the errors of covenant theology are due to the failure to recognize the difference between Israel as a diachronic national body that includes many unbelievers and the church as a called out group of saved individuals from all nations. Once we get that straight and once we use literal interpretation, God's word basically forces us into premillennialism. Now, this church holds to a pre-tribulation rapture, and so do I. The reasons for that are a little bit too complex to go into now, but simply recognize this. Since the church has a separate identity from Israel, doesn't it make sense that God would remove the church from the earth when he resumes to focus on bringing the nation of Israel to faith in him? It really does. That's a dispensational distinction. All right, will you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. It is rich. It is without any doubt true and absolutely inerrant. And yet it is very big. It is very deep. And it takes a lot of work to understand it. Thank you that we live at the end of a long history of godly believers who have worked very hard to understand your word. Thank you that we can read through their ideas and stand on their shoulders and gain from their insights. Father, I personally am very grateful for those who follow covenant theology who have been great defenders of the faith and especially of the true gospel. Thank you for the work that they did. Thank you, Father, also for those who have emphasized the importance of literal interpretation. And thank you that when we do approach your word with consistent literal interpretation, we find abundant proof of your faithfulness through the example of your people Israel and the ways that you have been faithful to them in the past and the ways that you say and promise and will certainly be faithful to them in the future. Let that certainty provide us a rock, a place of comfort, living in a world that seems to be sinking on sand. Let us never doubt your promises. Let us embrace them with joy and with confidence. And when days are good, let us broadcast our praise and thanks to you. And when days are hard, let us not be shaken. Because your word is true and you keep your promises. Amen.